Big news about GPT-5 today. Looks like we have specific details about the architecture as well as an estimate of the release date, which is just around the corner. And this is from OpenAI itself. The headline here is that they're confirming that this model will be orders of magnitude better than GPT-4. Let's dive in. All right, so big thanks to AI safety memes. And originally, I think Bioshock is the person that posted this. But the CEO of OpenAI Japan says GPT Next will be released this year. And its effective computational load is 100 times greater than GPT-4. So this was an event that took place on September 3rd called KDDI Summit 2024. And they had this speech by Mr. Tadao Nagasaki, who is OpenAI Japan LLC representative, executive officer, and president. So this is from the horse's mouth itself, I guess you could say, from OpenAI, not their San Francisco Bay Area office, but the Japan office. And it lines up with what we've heard from Microsoft talking about GPT Next, the next big model. So a lot of these rumors and announcements, they are lining up. So GPT Next, released this year in 2024, will be 100 times greater than the previous version, the GPT-4, which was 100 times greater than the GPT-3 era. And the future models will be 100 times bigger than the previous models. So really fast to understand these numbers, it's important to understand what OOM means. And you'll be hearing this, I think, a lot more moving forward because a lot of the measurements that we use to kind of describe these models, well, they're getting into the billions, the trillions, Billions. Everything is 100x, 1000x. So one way that people that are kind of inside that kind of like communicate roughly how different models and their abilities kind of compare to each other is in ooms, counting the ooms. Ooms is, of course, orders of magnitude. So if you increase a model 10 times, that's one order of magnitude, right? You're adding a zero at the end of it. So orders of magnitude is 100x plus, right? Basically adding multiple zeros at the end of it. And we know that when we're talking about compute, so the computer horsepower, if you will, that we're putting towards these models that increases in compute scale very predictably. The more compute, the better the model works. So for example, here on the left, this is from Sora. This is kind of the base compute, the lowest level. And they tried generating a picture of a puppy wearing a hat. It does not look good. We go to four times the compute. All of a sudden, you can see the puppy, the legs, the hat, the owner in the background, the snow, shadows, etc. Next, we throw 32 times the compute from the base. And all of a sudden, it's looking good. It's crisp, it's sharp, it's photorealistic. Same model, same data, same prompt. The only thing that changes is it has more compute. So if you want to get an idea of how GPT-2 from 2019 compares to GPT-3 from 2020 or GPT-4 from 2023, yeah, you can kind of estimate the compute that goes into it. You can look at the flops and that's been used in, for example, some of the laws that were passed by US and, and the EU. They used flops as a measurement for how powerful these models were. But I think a much simpler way of looking at it is to look at ooms, orders of magnitude, right? So GPT-2, which was pretty bad. So if GPT-2 was like kind of like a preschooler, that's kind of the level of tasks that it could reliably do. GPT-3, elementary schooler. GPT-4 is like a smart high schooler. GPT-3.5, you know, on the various LSATs, ATs, AP Calculus, Chemistry, etc. You know, it's 34th percentile, 32nd, some, sometimes as high as 87th, some as low as, you know, third, the third percentile. GPT-4, on the hand, 90th, 88th, 97th, 99th. It, in general, will be kind of very, very near the top. So the jump from GPT-2 to GPT-3 was about two ooms, two orders of magnitude, right? So you can think of that as 100x or 200x, you know, at 1000x, it would be three orders of magnitude. So in, anywhere kind of in that range. And then the jump from GPT-3 to GPT-4, again, we're looking at basically another two ooms, orders of magnitude, maybe 1.5 to 2. So this is a very important metric to kind of understand. Every two orders of magnitude increase is what we see between GPT-2, 3, and 4. Those are the jumps. So the fact that not just OpenAI Japan, but also Microsoft are kind of sticking to that growth, kind of that two orders of magnitude growth between models. And they're projecting that for not only the next model coming out soon, but also the one following that kind of suggests that this train is not stopping. It's not slowing down. They've also mentioned Orion and Strawberry, which we've covered in a previous video. So the idea was that these models can be used to produce synthetic data to train other models. Strawberry, of course, is really good at producing reasoning, how it reasons about various problems, which we saw from Microsoft as early as Orca 2 saying that 
this reasoning that the output, that the model's output can be very effective in creating smaller, very capable models. So it's kind of interesting to see that it really does seem like OpenAI is really shifting a lot of stuff that they're doing. Potentially, we have yet to see if this is true or not, but it does seem like they're shifting more towards this idea of a sort of a hive queen producing smaller models. Again, they've hinted at that. We're not 100% sure yet, but they're saying that GPT-4 Next, which will be released this year, 2024, is expected to be trained using a miniature version of Strawberry with roughly the same computational resources as GPT-4 with an effective computational load 100 times greater. This idea of an effective computational load is kind of interesting. And Leopold Aschenbrenner did talk about what that might mean in his situational awareness paper. And he's saying you can think of AI progress, these like exponential increases as a couple different pieces. One is just compute. Just we have more hardware. We have more chips that power this stuff. But also two, it's the algorithmic efficiencies. So algorithmic progress that we can think of as growing effective compute. So if we're able to figure out how to make these models run faster, be more efficient, we're effectively being able to do more with the same amount of compute. The reason this is important is because I think a lot of people will be like, oh, so they're using 100 times more electricity, they're producing 100 times more waste or whatever. No, not necessarily. You got to look at it from also the algorithmic progress. And then three, the unhobbling of gains, fixing obvious ways in which models are hobbled by default, unlocking latent capabilities, and giving them tools leading to step changes in usefulness. Oh, and here they actually make it uh, a little bit more clear that this 100 times increase probably does not refer to the scaling of computing resources, but rather the effective computational volume, including improvements to the architecture and learning efficiency. So it's probably some combination of hardware, that kind of algorithmic improvements that together come to that 100x improvement. And Orion, which has been in the spotlight recently, was trained for several months on the equivalent of 10,000 H100s compared to GPT-4, adding 10 times the computational resource scale, making it plus three ooms, orders of magnitude greater, and is expected to be released sometime next year. And this is a really great little chart. Uh, looks like sources Peter Gostev on LinkedIn. So bravo, Peter, this is phenomenal. And I think really in, illustrates how a lot of the stuff is, is proceeding because you have the jump from GPT-3 and as we get to GPT-4, of course, that's a massive scale up. It's bigger, much bigger. And same thing with GPT-5, it's bigger still. It's gonna be much more massive. How much more? We'll see in just a second. We believe GPT-4 was somewhere something like 1.7 trillion. But it's also important to understand that at the same time, we're using this optimization to create these smaller, faster models, GPT-40 mini, GPT-40. So the race isn't just to build the best, biggest model possible. It's also, are we able to kind of distill them, to quantize them, to make them more efficient and pull out, let's say, 99% of the usefulness, the effect of this while making it, you know, a third the size or half the size. And so again, this is Nagasaki at the KDDI Summit 2024. So he's the CEO of OpenAI Japan. And he's saying that the number of active ChatGPT users has exceeded 200 million at the end of August. And it's the fastest software in history to reach 100 to 200 million active users. He mentioned that they're planning to integrate ChatGPT into everything. So into iPhones. We knew that. We knew they had some sort of a partnership with Apple, but also many, many more. It looks like Spotify, Harvey, Coca-Cola, Moderna, Apple, we know Apple. This is Morgan Stanley, BCG. And I can't make out these two, but this logo seems familiar. He mentions that GPT-4 is, of course, multimodal. It's able to do formats of data such as audio and images. Comment below if you got that on your phone yet. Are you one of the lucky few people that's in the alpha? I think that they're still rolling out the alpha. But anyways, next he mentions GPT next, hundred times bigger and that AI technology grows exponentially. In the Q&A, Nagasaki explains why he got involved with OpenAI, saying that he wanted to help Japan understand AI correctly, use it correctly, and achieve the right results. He mentions what makes AI different from other technologies up until now is that it can do things like humans can. Because of this, it has the potential to change what we call services in a very positive way. The impact and scale of it on society will be huge. I really wanted to contribute to that and I thought I could actually make it. He's also saying Japan and AI are a good match. And of course, Japan has some of the most favorable laws for AI, certainly in terms of copyright and uh, training AI models on various images and how the copyright is handled. I think Japan has one of the most like forgiving and open and AI-friendly laws. And when asked why 
open. I chose Japan as one of its sort of bases off, off campus, if you will, away from the Bay Area. Nagasaki said Japan has a history of being eager to pursue innovation and new technologies. And really, I think the laws that they pass kind of signal to these AI companies that, hey, Japan, you know, we're going to play ball. Get in here, play with us. We'll, we'll be a good sort of base of operations in Asia, for example, for you to build from. He also believes that AI will be great for Japan. Japan is one of the first countries to face social issues such as declining birth rate and aging population, which is true. Certainly having AI do a lot of the services and eventually hopefully robots that can help with some of the physical tasks will be important if your labor pool is shrinking, if you have an aging population. Things like that could certainly help out a lot. They would have a big, big impact. And I think we've mentioned this before, but Alex Gravely, CEO of agent startup Minion AI, and former chief architect at GitHub Copilot said that using Strawberry to generate higher quality training data could reduce the number of errors, also known as hallucinations that OpenAI's models produce. So we believe he's talking about producing high quality synthetic data to train kind of that next generation of models. He continues, imagine a model that has no hallucinations, that solves logic puzzles and gets it right the first time. The reason the model can do that is because the training data is less ambiguous. So it has to make fewer guesses. Again, that was kind of like the big deal about ORCA 2. That probably wasn't the first study kind of showing that this was possible. The QSTAR paper kind of talked about some of the same things, basically having models giving you a problem, asking it to think through step by step how to solve it. Then you take that output, that data, and use that data to train a brand new smaller model. And that brand new smaller model ends up being really good at doing that type of reasoning. So you might be wondering, well, why don't they produce just a bunch of little models instead of like one big one, like Orion or the strawberry one? Why not just like a million tiny little models that each do their own thing? I'm glad you asked. Here's Jimmy Apples saying GPT-5 and a Samsung exec. The noise is getting louder. So here's an image from Semicon Taiwan. Let's do some online sleuthing and see what we can learn. Enhance image. Oh, that's, that's not a real thing. Never mind. So I can't quite make out what the number of parameters here is, right? So GPT-4, 1.7 trillion. GPT-5, also in trillions. But what what is that? Is that 3-5 trillion? Like it's between 3 and 5 trillion? But no, because here, you know, like the dash is in the middle, like where it's supposed to be. Chebby has a great guess here saying that it's like three by five. So basically we can assume a mixture of experts, so that idea of exactly what we're talking about. So instead of being a one large model, it's a collection of sort of sub models, a bunch of smaller models all kind of put together. And then when you ask it a question, it gets routed to the correct model that answers that question. So are people reading that as like, like a, like a three by five, right? Like, so three times five trillion parameters, three models put together by five trillion parameters each. That, that doesn't seem right. So Semi-Analysis posted this in July 10th, 2023, where they kind of spilled the beans on a lot of the potential architecture and tricks behind GPT-4, behind that model. So for example, it was believed that OpenAI used in GPT-4, 16 experts. So mixture of experts, 16 experts. And while researchers have shown that using 64 to 120 experts achieves better loss than 16 experts, that's purely research. Here was a podcast with George Hotz of TinyCorp that was published on Latent Space. Here's a quick clip about what he believes the GPT-4's real architecture is. What are some of the numbers people should think of when they compare compute to like people? So GPT-4 was 100 person years of training. That's more like on, on the time scale. Um, 20 petaflops is one person. I think you, um, right now the math was that for the price of the most expensive thing we build, which is the International Space Station, mm -hmm. we could build uh, one Tampa of yeah, yeah, uh, one, one Tampa of compute, <laughs> yeah, which one is four hundred thousand currency people. of, com of yeah. uh, measurement. Um, yeah, yeah, we could build. So, like the biggest training clusters today, I know less about how GPT four was trained. I know some rough numbers on the weights and stuff, but uh, Llama a, a trillion parameters. Well, okay, so GPT four is two hundred twenty billion in each head, and then it's an eight way mixture model. So mixture models are what you do when you're out of ideas. Um, yeah. So, you know, it's, it's a mixture model. Uh, they just train the same model eight times. And they have some little trick. They actually do 16 inferences. But um, well, no, it's not so like... So the multimodality is just a vision model kind of glom well, glommed on. No, no, the mixture has nothing to do with the vision or language aspect of it. It just has to do with, well, okay, we can't really make models bigger than 220 billion parameters. Uh, we want it to be better. Well, how can we make it better? Well, we can train it longer. 
And okay, we're actually we've actually already maxed that out. Uh, <laughs> getting diminishing returns there. Okay, mixture of experts. Uh, yeah, mixture of experts. We'll train eight of them, right? All right. So all right. So you know, you know, you know. The the real truth is, whenever a start, whenever a company is secretive, with the exception of Apple, Apple's the only exception. Whenever a company is secretive, it's because they're hiding something that's not that cool. Yeah. And people have this wrong idea over and over again that they think they're hiding it because it's really cool. It must be amazing. It's a trillion parameters. No, it's a little bigger than GPT-3, and they did an eight-way mixture of experts. Like, all right, dude, anyone can spend eight times the money and get that. All right. um, but I had to dig up my video from when I posted about that whatever it was, a year plus ago, to find that, like the actual details and what happened. This was still in the early days when I was starting out. A lot of people asked me what's in the background of my videos. And here you can kind of tell what it is, actually. In a lot of the videos, you couldn't tell what it was. And I was too embarrassed to admit at the time, but I just think I'm more shameless now. This That was my bed. I would sleep here. I would roll out of bed, then come around, sit at my desk, and record AI videos. You probably didn't care, but there you go. So anyways, coming back to our uh, presentation, I mean, they, they have the model size of GPT-5 or GPT Next, whatever it's going to be called. It, they have it listed here. So what is that number there? Is it three to five trillion? Is that what that's saying? Then why is the thing up here? Is it as Chubby's guessing some sort of a three by five trillion? But yeah, it looks like I'm not the only one trying to figure out what that symbol is. So if you know what this means, please elucidate it for us and comment down below in the comments. And to the people that made this graphic, I have just one thing to say. Nanda yo. And of course, this kind of goes hand in hand with what Microsoft announced, I believe, earlier this year that GPT-5 is sort of the size jump from an orca, GPT-4, to a blue whale. And speaking of orcas, did you know that there was a prehistoric whale which was much bigger than orcas, called the Leviathan. Much bigger than orcas, very smart, hunted in pods, and from the sound of it, just completely destroyed and ate everything, competing with the Megalodon. And here's its tooth, just for reference. Why did I bring this up? Well, I'm really not sure. I guess just one more reason not to mess around with time travel. If you enjoyed today's video, please give me a thumbs up, subscribe. My name is Wes Roth, and thank you for watching.